To whoever this may impact, sometimes our lives have to be completely shaken up, changed, and rearranged to relocate is where we're really meant to be. Sometimes change feels like loss, transformation is scary, and sometimes to discover the best version of ourselves, we must let go of absolutely everything holding us down. Welcome to I Missed Me, your new safe space. I Missed Me's purpose is to help people all around the world to come back home to themselves. It is a healing self-growth podcast that encourages people to dive deep into their emotions, heal their traumas, and ultimately love themselves. My name is Mafia Sures, I am your host, and I hope to be a part of your healing journey. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know which is more exciting to a producer, a play by Somerset Maugham or a performance by Betty Davis. But we have both in the Lux Radio Theater tonight, and the pulse of this producer is beating double time. For Miss Davis again proves her genius in one of Mr. Maugham's most powerful dramas, The Letter. And you'll hear more than one star performance, for with Miss Davis, we have Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson, who share honors with her in Warner Brothers' film production of this play. The letter's the story of a beautiful woman fighting the heat and privations of a jungle backcountry who tears to shreds the lives of two men. It's a great part for a great actress, and we had no trouble in persuading Betty Davis to return from an Eastern vacation to play it at this microphone. The result of her gracious gesture is the kind of bill that would mean standing room only in any ordinary theater. But, of course, this theater always has enough seats to go around, all the way around, the whole country. That's one reason it's a national theater. Tonight's performance comes to you with the best wishes of Lux Flakes. And just as you have made this theater a weekly custom in so many American homes, you've made Lux Flakes a daily custom in your homes, too. And that adds up to an all-American rating for both plays and product. And now get ready for a dramatic experience you'll never forget. The curtain rises on the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce, with Sen Young as the lawyer's assistant. Just north of Singapore, on the Malay Peninsula, lie the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce worked by native labor, ruled by a handful of white men. In the main bungalow on one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through shaded windows. The night is hot and humid, the soft breeze heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. (gasps) Missy! Missy! I hear gunfire! Missy Crosby! I hear... That man, that is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I, I, I think him dead. You shoot him, Miss Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy. I try. Crosby? Huh? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in the room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what's happened? 
Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... to make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie. Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you've come. Well, darling, Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about. (laughs) It'll be all right. There now, that's better. I'll... I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Of course I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Howard, come in. I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Well, naturally, I'd want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help, then? Of course I will. In every way I can. You're a dear. Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy, Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Yes. Charming girl. She came last week. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you'd better be resting. I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, darling. I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tiresome. Nonsense. You're being very brave. She's bearing up wonderfully, Mr. Joyce. Yes. Yes, she is. Um, how long have you been here? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes, he was just riddled with bullets. What? Here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm, I'm on sort of a duty, you know. I'll have one, Bob. Well, you feeling any better, Leslie? Oh, much better, thanks. Mrs. Crosby, I know it seems brutal, but I'm afraid it's my duty to um, ask you some questions. I think that can wait, Mr. Willis, until my oh, wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us exactly what happened, Leslie. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at number four plantation. Why, never mind being alone. A planter's wife gets used to that. My dear. I had dinner rather late, and I started working on my lace. I don't know how long I'd been working when suddenly I heard footsteps outside, and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening. Can I come in? Well, I was startled because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked? Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said, come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was, rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation getting out a a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another... He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we went on chatting until... Well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. And did you answer him? Yes, I said I don't care a row of beans what you think about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Leslie, let her finish, Bob. In that case, I said, I can only think you half-witted. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I, I think a woman makes a perfect fool of herself if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Well, we've known him for seven years, Robert, and he's never paid me the smallest attention. I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We hadn't seen very much of him in the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said, That's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there were some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts, all you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair, 
I was standing in front of the table, about here. He rose and stood in front of me. I held out my hand. Good night, I said. But he just stood and looked at me, and his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. Well, then I began to lose my temper. You poor fool, don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys from the veranda, and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. But I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking and saying he loved me and he loved me. And... Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I, I struggled to get free, but he was too strong for me. He started to carry me and then, well, he stumbled on those steps. But I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up and ran after me, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch, grabbed the railing, and slipped through his hand as he fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another, until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there. Lying in the moonlight. It was only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say that I think you behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry that we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. You were all very kind. It's quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Uh, Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd like to see the body. Oh, yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert. What have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths on it wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. It's so horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie. Why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Don't say it that way, darling. It sounds so... so in the past. Nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you any more, I would now. Robert. Indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yes, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start for Singapore as soon as we've finished. Right away. Why, well, it's still dark, Howard. It'll be 8 o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, with us? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be... Arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, as a matter of fact, I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be imprisoned? That's up to the Attorney General. It's possible that after you've told him your story, he'll be able to accept bail. He's a very good fellow. I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it depends on what the charge is. What? What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible. And in that case, well, I'm afraid an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, darling. No, no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. It won't be long. Uh, let me do it, Robert. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? When I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh. 
Yes. It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified. I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Well, there, Leslie, I shouldn't have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. she saying? Mr. Crosby, to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Howard, how is she? Sit down, Bob. Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir, I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong, thanks. Ong's been of great help on the case. He finds out everything. The perfect confidential clerk. I tried to catch you at the house. I had to see you, Howard. Oh, you needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know, you're always welcome. How is... Everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing. I'm all in. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, Bob. I've tried to work, but it's no good. The estate can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. Then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks. I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you better get some sleep and after your plant is closed before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She's a plucky woman. It's monstrous they should have kept her in that filthy prison all this time. They had no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. The whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Because she admitted killing a man in a civilized community. A trial's inevitable. She shot him as she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Bob. It's curious that Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden... That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Could she be one of the witnesses? I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that marriage a secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, nonsense. Now stop worrying about the trial. That's your lawyer's job. Thanks, old man. I'll see you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joyce. Well on? If you are not too busy, sir, might I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all, Arm. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes? A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is in existence a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I've no doubt Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of the late Mr. Hammond's death. Well? You will no doubt recall that Mrs. Crosby has stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. In my opinion, this letter indicates that her statement is not, in every respect, accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy in my handwriting. You can understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, it's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir, that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter might be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? Might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well. You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial's only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one less. Just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. Time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. And... But I'll... I'll confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Leslie, 
One of the things that's impressed me is that each time you told your story, you've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. What does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe? Oh, quite. I'm positive of that. Let's see, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren's. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. Well, one time you've been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. and He was very popular, you know. Had a good many calls on his time. And, well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. Are you quite certain that was all? Well, I may as well tell you. We heard about his, um, his wife. And once... Just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh, you never mentioned that. What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond? Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Oh, well, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asks him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. You'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. If the original is in your handwriting, be no use denying it. It could be a forgery. It's difficult to prove that. It would be easy to prove it was genuine. Well, but it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your house, boys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you that I did not write this letter. Very well. Then there's nothing more to talk about. I'll be going. Howard? Howard, wait a minute. I, um... I, I did write it, but I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you would believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I shall have to talk to you very plainly. I told Bob today that I was certain of your acquittal, and I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all. But this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, not to convict her even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove that Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove, but if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... Oh, no. They... 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 Leslie! Matron! Matron, quickly! Yes, sir? Call nurse. Mrs. Crosby's ill. <laughs> Mr. DeMille will return in just a moment with our stars, Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson for Act Two of the letter. Well, Sally here looks as if she wanted to say something first. What is it, Sally? I just want to look into the future for a moment, Mr. Ruick. Yes? What do you see there, Sally? Good news. A hundred years from now, there won't be any spring house cleaning. Hmm, you don't say. Why not? Because everything in the house will be waterproof. You just hose down a room, and presto, it's clean. Hmm, very simple indeed. But it won't help women who are doing their spring house cleaning right now. Oh, but I know something that'll make things awfully easy for them. So do I. New Quick Lux Flakes. Right. And I've heard loads of women say they've never seen anything like it. They love the way it bursts into suds at the touch of water. Yes, and it's amazing how rich those suds are, too. All fine, pure soap. No harmful alkali of any kind. 
And new quick lux goes so far. Yes, and it gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other soaps tested. And that's true even in hard water. It's thrifty. It's so safe, too. There's nothing to hurt any color or fabric that's safe in water alone. It's wonderful how nice curtains and blankets and bedspreads look after a dip in new quick lux. And that goes for dozens of other things, too. Everything safe in water alone. Ladies, now that you're busy with your spring house cleaning, get the fast, easy help New Quick Lux gives. Ask your grocer for a thrifty big box of New Quick Lux flakes tomorrow. It comes in the same familiar package at no extra cost. And here's more news. Right now, thousands of grocers are featuring New Quick Lux flakes in their spring house cleaning sales. It's a grand time to stock up. Use New Quick Lux for all your soap and water tasks. To help keep your things new looking longer, to save your hands. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce. In that split fraction of a moment before her mind slipped into the blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence, enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in her chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if, if the owner wasn't quite prepared to sell it. That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you'll understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no better than suborning a witness. Do you mean to say you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie, but a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good, and he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world, and this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang me? I don't despise you. It isn't important what I feel about you, do you understand? I'm going to do what I can. Oh. Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent him from seeing it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial... I'm going to try and save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. Do you think your friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter. The woman has it. She did not know its value. Until my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? <laughs> Why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank of the British Malaya Company a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Ten thousand dollars is a good deal of money, Ong. Yes, it is a good deal of money. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. 
I can take you to the house whenever you are ready, sir. What's the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. You must be mad. Good heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks you could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe the judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Ong Chi Seng. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir. And the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. Sit down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, thanks. Well, you're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you finally convinced me we've nothing to worry about. Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something's come up. Uh, oh, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yeah? Uh, it seems that Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She, she wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. Well, this was a pretty serious mistake and she realized it. Who has the letter? Hammond's widow and she threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just to explain it to you. <laughs> yes, but don't you see, it might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if Hammond came to your house by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. Buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now I'll put the matter out of your mind. Oh, uh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I arranged to have her release pending trial. Leslie, don't tell me that's the same lace I saw you working on at the McFerrin's. How can you go so fast? Well, I haven't had anything else much to do this past month. What's it going to be? It's too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, uh, uh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Bob, why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, it won't take all evening, will it, Ron? Well, there's a lot to go over. No use you three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, darling, go ahead. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. Come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of us. <laughs> Night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? Chinese Quarter. Some sort of a shop, I believe. Well, I always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you want to, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Maybe it's my own sense of guilt, but I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Oh, forget what I said. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? Well, I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience... I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I've felt it all evening, trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt. An island south of here, Guadi. It had been dormant for years, and then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sea and sky crimson, and three villages melted into ashes. It's time we were starting. Aung Chi Seng will be waiting for us. Come in. Please come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I will return in just a moment. Let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger. It's 
the workmanship and the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes, one against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. Where is she? You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what's she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. Nei go fung sun. Hai shi ma. Fung sun. Yuk te ak de ang mo. Ngo sun da kom hou le. Yuk te ak de ang mo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret, but the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. Yuk fung le. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Hammond has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now look here, tell her this oh, is enough. Oh, it's all right, Howard. I don't mind. May you need some soon. What does she say, Mrs. Hammond? You may have the letter if you will pick it up. At her feet. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. You find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. And from that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standard, remember, I'm out of practice. <laughs> Dorothy, darling, they're wonderful. Never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over, Leslie's safe. Darling. Well, anyone planning to bathe, shower, or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. A shower for me. I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, d- d- don't go, Leslie. Why well, shan't be a minute? There's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? What's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. I think a bit of a holiday do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? You can't very well throw up your job. But I've got something in view that's much better. It's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life... The only thing is that you'll be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Well, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000. You can get the money the day after tomorrow. How on earth are you going to raise $30,000? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Uh, Robert, darling, I... Well, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense. Darling, you just said you wanted to go. Oh, no, but I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Well, anyhow, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why what... should I wait? It's a good thing, and I don't want to lose it. Look... I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, calm, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, Robert... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute. Howard. What are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said? Wants the money at once to buy the estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Give me a little time. I can pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, but Where I can't... Where is the letter? 
I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. He's coming. What shall I do, Leslie? It's up to you. Well? Tell him. Tell him and have done with it. The lights come up in the Lux Radio Theater as the curtain falls on Act Two of The Letter, starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson. Will everyone remain very quiet, please? Because in this brief intermission, I've asked one of our audience to help me in a little test. Here she comes to the microphone now. Her name is Mrs. Lee Millar. And your home, Mrs. Millar, is... Oakland, California. Well, we are delighted to have you with us, Mrs. Millar. Now, do you see what I have in my hand? Why, two rubber bands. Yes. Will you take this one and stretch it as far as it will go? That's right. It stretches, then snaps right back, doesn't it? Yes, Mr. Roick. Well, now do the same with the other. Why, it's broken in two. Yes, because the second rubber band was all dried out. It lost all its elasticity, so it broke under strain. Now, the reason I asked Mrs. Millar to make this test was because the very same thing can happen to stockings. You see, when stockings are new and live and supple, they have great elasticity. They can stretch as you walk or run or stoop down, then spring back into shape with each motion of your leg. Yes, that's true. But if the threads get all dried out and lifeless, why then... They break when they stretch. Right. Now, one way to weaken elasticity is to use a soap that contains harmful alkali. This dries out the fibers. Another way is to rub with cake soap. This weakens the fibers, makes them less elastic, and more apt to break under strain. And you have a run. Well, I always lux my stockings, Mr. Roy. Good, because lux saves elasticity. New Quick Lux Flakes have no harmful alkali. And with Lux, there's no rubbing. That's why Lux keeps silk elastic and cuts down runs. No wonder it's America's favorite stocking care. And recommended by over 90% of the makers of both silk and nylon stockings in the United States. Why not save your stockings by washing them every night with New Quick Lux Flakes? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille... Curtain rises on the third act of the letter. Robert Crosby has returned to the room. His thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation. In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, brimming over with enthusiasm, arrange his papers on the desk. This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of uh, what we've just been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the legal expenses. Oh, you know, I couldn't charge you anything for my services, but there are certain out-of-pocket oh, expenses... Oh, that's awfully that... decent of you. I'm not sure I could accept that. But what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, uh, I'd almost forgotten... You see, you were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars? Well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. Oh, that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to the jury? I didn't dare. Well, you mean it was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. What was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it? You of all people... What were you trying to save me from? Leslie, you knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? But how should I know you're going to buy a gun? Well, because I told you. Well, I've forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking has, to me like who this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. 
Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We've been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie! Then I heard about that, that native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous pangles and that chalky face and eyes like a cobra's eyes. But I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. I would always been so careful about writing before. But this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied that I was frantic. I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. That it was true about the other woman. That she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew because now I'd leave him alone. I knew if he went out that door, I'd never see him again. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry and I saw I'd hit him. I ran after him and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this? To me, Leslie. How could you? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let myself go. I've got to think. Leslie. Well? He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple are the Prescott. Oh, yes. Robert's told me about them. You'll adore them, Leslie. Now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. Robert, it's lucky you brought your dinner coat. You'd hardly fit in one of Howard's. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, how about your studs? They're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. And through no fault of yours, I've failed you. Wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? Oh, I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I was asking I'll do everything to make you happy, everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless, Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me. As if... Robert. No, no, I can't, I can't, I can't! Leslie, tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed! Leslie, let me in. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Doris. I took rather long to dress. Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Leslie, please come downstairs. Of, of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. At last, he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the 
only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired, fired, and fired, and fired until there were no more cartridges. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's out there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby! Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She, my game, may come. She tell me I come here. She, Mrs. Hammond. Yo, Mrs. Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bling dagger. Leave it outside window. Yes. Dagger, Missy. She say bling dagger to you. She's here then. Miss Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Miss Crosby. She kill you. She wait there. That is what dagger me. She kill you. You go in garden. Missy, you know tell the police I come. You know tell the police I come. You know tell the police I come. Miss Dagger, see the workmanship on the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. Leslie! 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 Yes? You've got to do something about Bob. He's behaving very strangely. What is it? I don't know. First I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. <laughs> but where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money. I ought to get ahead fast. In 10, 15 years, I can live in London, travel... Do anything I please. Uh, Robert, will you come outside with me, darling, please? Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here. We've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra. Only Dutch and natives. Going to be a little lonely at first, maybe. But we'll get used to it. Robert, I... There'll be just the two of us. But my wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important thing. Stop it! Stop! Stop it! I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it. Give me a drink. I want a drink. <laughs> Howard, where is Leslie? Where did she go? She ran out into the garden. The garden? I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. What does the She say she kill her. It was right. She died. Leslie! 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 Bring to a close tonight's performance of The Letter. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But while we're waiting, listen to this. Hear that clock? Morning, noon, and night. 
three times a day, seven days a week, the dishes have to be washed. You can't get around it. But you can make it pleasanter, the way thousands of women have. That's with new, quick, Lux Flakes. It helps do away with one of the things women hate most about dishwashing. The red, rough housework look it gives your hands. Yes, new Quick Lux is kind to hands. This was recently proved by hundreds of dramatic one-hand tests made in a laboratory under conditions similar to home dishwashing. Five different soaps frequently used for dishwashing, including Lux, were tested. Three times a day for weeks, hundreds of women dipped one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from another soap. The results were amazing. The Lux hands looked so much softer and smoother than the other hands. Now you know that lovely hands are such an important part of a woman's charm. You want yours to stay soft and smooth, of course. So why not try new Quick Lux Flakes in your dishpan tomorrow? Will you do that? It's in the same familiar box, and it costs you no more. It's fast, thrifty, and so kind to your hands. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Back for a curtain call come the stars of the letter. Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson. Mr. DeMille, I know Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson joined me in thanking every member of the fine cast which appeared with us tonight. <laughs> and so do we. Tell me, how was your vacation, Betty? Oh, I always have a wonderful time in New Hampshire. We've been reading about the big celebration they had of the premiere of your new picture, The Great Liar, Littleton. Your birthday, too, wasn't it, Betty? Yes, Jimmy. We were trying to raise some money for local charity... And Warner Brothers very kindly came through with the premiere of The Great Lie to help us raise the money. After that birthday party, Hollywood must seem like a ghost town. Well, it seems restful for the first time. I've enjoyed very much coming back to the Lux Radio Theater tonight, Mr. DeMille. And I'd like to know what you plan for next week. Next week's play, Betty, is the delightful comedy, Wife, Husband, and Friend. And who's in the cast, Mr. DeMille? We're going to have George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick. You'll hear George Brent as a perfectly normal businessman whose wife, played by Priscilla Lane, is ambitious to become an opera singer. The solution to this domestic problem comes in a surprise twist that made the 20th Century Fox picture a hit on the screen and gives us a gay and exciting prospect for next Monday night. That's a show I certainly don't want to miss, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> You've written your names in red letters here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just learned that the Lux Radio Theater has again been selected by the readers of the Movie Radio Guide magazine as the best dramatic program on the air. It's the third consecutive year that this theater has received the Movie Radio Guide Award. And to all who participated in the poll, we express the gratitude of our sponsors and of the entire staff of this theater. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick in Wife, Husband, and Friend. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, Adventure in Washington. James Stevenson appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of Shining Victory. Now, an important announcement. As you know, many localities switch to daylight saving time next Sunday. If your community is one of those changing to daylight saving time, you will hear this program at the usual hour. If your community remains on standard time... Tune in one hour earlier. Check your newspaper or radio magazine for the correct time. Included in tonight's play were Richard Davis as Withers, Charlie Lung as head boy, Gloria Holden as the woman, and Suzanne Caron, Wally Mayer, Eleanor Stewart, Eric Snowden, and Leela Hyams McIntyre. Our music is directed by Louis Silver. Our Lux Radio Theater production of The Letter has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of new quick Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes 
used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great picture studios here in Hollywood to protect the million-dollar wardrobes that you see on the screen. Your announcer has been Melville Roy, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. To whoever this may impact, sometimes our lives have to be completely shaken up, changed, and rearranged to relocate us where we're really meant to be. Sometimes change feels like loss, transformation is scary, and sometimes to discover the best version of ourselves, we must let go of absolutely everything holding us down. Welcome to I Missed Me, your new safe space. I Missed Me's purpose is to help people all around the world to come back home to themselves. It is a healing self-growth podcast that encourages people to dive deep into their emotions, heal their traumas, and ultimately love themselves. My name is Mafia Sures, I am your host, and I hope to be a part of your healing journey.